Christ. This morning we'll be looking at Luke chapter 13, beginning at verse 18. If you have a Bible with you, I'd appreciate it if you'd open and read with me. If you don't have a Bible, there are many around the room that we welcome you to use. And if you don't have a Bible, please take this one. Um, we would love for you to have a Bible in your own home if you don't have one. Luke chapter 13, beginning at verse 18. He said, Jesus, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And again he said, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you. I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform curses today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Many years ago, there was a situation comedy that was on television called Coach. And I uh, enjoyed watching it from time to time. Uh, coach Fox was the head football coach at a fictional college in Minnesota. And uh, he had all sorts of trials and travails in his personal life and in his life as a coach. And one particular episode really sticks out. Uh, coach Fox was having one of those weeks. His football team was falling apart. His personal life was falling apart. And he was alone by himself. And he looked up at the sky and said, isn't somebody up there keeping track of things like this? And I often feel that way. And I think maybe you do too. Life caves in on us our jobs, our schools, our families. There are just tragedies and rotten circumstances all around us. And we kind of look up and say, God, are you keeping track of this stuff? You, you, you've promised not to give us more than we can bear, but it seems like maybe you should be interested in sharing this load of mine around a little bit. I know that we feel that way, and I know that we wonder sometimes how... 
God is working. Even those of us who are followers of Jesus wonder, um, how does God work in this world and, and through all these things that are happening in my life, in, in our lives? We have to remember that there is some mystery in the life of faith. Uh, after all, in Hebrews it says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We, we can't see everything, and so there is some mystery. And it's interesting that in the New Testament and in Luke, there are times that Jesus reveals to us things about how God works in the world. And you can tell when one of these statements is going to come from Jesus because he'll often say something like, the kingdom of God is like. And whenever Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, he's talking about the ways in which Jesus is ruling and reigning. There has been a past history of the kingdom, God has been ruling and reigning in the past. There's a, there's a present part of it. God is ruling and reigning right now. And there is going to be a glorious future. We've been singing about that even today. There is the hope of heaven when the kingdom will be completely visible and we will be, we will be able to see clearly the reign and the rule of God in the world. Well, we have one of those statements that begins this section in Luke this morning, and I wanted to just fill you in on where we're going to go for the next couple of minutes. First of all, we're going to look at what's happening in these three sections of Luke chapter 13. Next, we're going to see how they fit together. And then finally, we're going to explore what we should do with this truth that we find in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, the first section of this passage is about two little things, a mustard seed and yeast. A mustard seed is a really, really small seed, and it actually grows up to be a bush that can be 10 to 12 feet high. And, and if you take a little mustard seed and you were to put it in front of a bird, even a small bird, that bird could eat the mustard seed and still need a main course. It's a very small, small seed, but it grows to be this bush 10 or 12 feet high, and birds can actually perch on it. They, they can actually sit and rest on a mustard bush. And so we know that there are other seeds like that, but Jesus uses this example and says, uh, the kingdom is, is like that mustard seed. A, a very small seed results in something very large, very big. And, and Jesus also says the kingdom is like yeast or, or, or leaven. We don't make a whole lot of homemade bread anymore. Our bread comes from King Supers. And so we don't see yeast and, and we don't buy yeast like we once did. But we know that a very small amount of yeast added to a little bit of dough impacts that entire portion of dough. And so in these two examples, Jesus teaches us how the kingdom of God operates. The kingdom of God will expand in the world even with a very small beginning. Our, our church is an example of that. Uh, Primo mentioned, we, st we started over 50 years ago in somebody's basement. And, and now today, here we sit. We started with just a few people, and now we have many more people. The kingdom of God is, is like that mustard seed. But the yeast example shows us the transforming power of the kingdom of God. In your life, you, at one point in time, got just a little bit of God's truth. You got just a little bit of God's Word, and it transformed all of you and keeps on transforming. Well, there's another section, 
section about a door, the narrow door in the house in verses 22 to 30. And th this section came a, a little bit after Jesus had talked about the kingdom, and a person asked a question. And sometimes you and I think about this question. Lord, will those who are saved be few? I've had interesting discussions with people about this question. I, I've sat at tables and we've talked and said, you know, I think when we get to heaven, we might be surprised at the, the number of people that are there. I, I think we'll be surprised at maybe people that we thought that would be there who, who aren't and, and people that we had no clue about who, who actually are there. And so that question of, Lord, are there going to be a lot of people saved or, or just a few people saved? And it's interesting that Jesus doesn't answer that question. Jesus apparently thinks there's something more important than that question about how many people are going to come to him and, and follow him and be saved and end up in heaven. And Jesus says in verse 24, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Why, why is the door narrow? Well, because you can only get through the door in the ways that Jesus has been talking about. And Jesus has been talking over and over about repentance, turning around from sin and following Jesus, and, and faith, trust. And that's how you go through the door, and it's hard. Someday the door will be closed. The offer to follow Jesus and live with him forever will someday be, be gone. We won't always have the offer in front of us. There'll be a day that we die, and the offer is gone. We, we, there's no second chance. And there'll be a day that Christ returns physically. There'll be no chance after that. Jesus barely finishes talking about this narrow door when he tells us that the narrow door leads into a house, and people will be standing outside the house knocking in order to get in. And the master of the house doesn't let them in. The door is closed. What's this all about? It's all about getting into the kingdom of God. Jesus warns people, hey, just because you ate and drank with me, just because you were around when I was teaching, just because I shook your hand, just because I gave you a high five, that doesn't mean that you are in a right relationship with God. Listening to the teachings of Jesus, singing songs about his greatness, and even having a close relationship with his people does not mean that we have a relationship with God. That only comes through personal faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, he will say to you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out, and people will come from east and west, north and south, and recline at table in the kingdom of God. The vast, vast majority of people that were listening to Jesus on this occasion and throughout most of Luke's gospel are Jewish people. And their thought was, at the end of time, we will be hanging out with our guys. And, and who are our guys for the Jews? Well, they were the big guys. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the, the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Those are our guys. And Jesus is here saying, Hey, Jewish brothers and sisters, you think that you're going to be with all these guys, but you could be looking into a house where all of your guys are there with the true followers. 
Gentiles who come from the east and west and the north and the south. You can't be in the kingdom unless you repent from sin and trust Jesus. Last section of this portion is about a chicken, specifically a hen with chicks. Something funny happens in verse 31. For about the only time I can think of in the entire New Testament, the Pharisees want to help Jesus. <laughs> now, you really ought to take notice when the Pharisees actually want to do something nice for Jesus, and they come to Jesus and warn him, hey, Herod is after you, Jesus. He wants to kill you. And one of the questions that we would have is, wow, why at this point in time would the Pharisees want to help Jesus? And the only thing that I can think of is a football analogy. When the Broncos are playing the Raiders, even Chargers fans cheer for the Broncos, right? And that's what's happening here. King Herod is so against everyone's way of life in the Jewish faith that even the Pharisees don't want Jesus to get killed by this guy who is so evil toward the Jews. But Jesus here again makes clear, I'm on my way to Jerusalem. It's my job, it's my duty. Nevertheless, I must go on my way. He has turned his face to Jerusalem, and he is headed in that direction. And he says something ironic, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Jesus does not mean that no prophet had ever died away from Jerusalem. He's just saying that it's awfully ironic that Jerusalem, this city of God, this place where worship was set up for the very first time for God's people to build a temple, this place, this holy place, was going to kill the greatest prophet, the very Son of God himself. Jerusalem was chosen by God to be the center of worship for Israel and the center of God's unique presence and redeeming work in the world. And this horrible thing was going to happen to the very Son of God. And Jesus reveals his heart. And your Bible might have the word lament here. O oh, Jerusalem, O oh, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who sent it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A lament is simply a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. And Jesus looked at this once great city and hurt. Some of you here may remember um, my brother. My brother's been gone. Uh, he died about 14 or 15 years ago. And I've shared his story with many of you, but my brother uh, grew up in a the same home I did, the home of a, of a pastor. We had a, a great home life. But my brother rebelled and turned his back on God and lived a lifestyle for 18 or 20 years that was far, far, far away from God. And in the early years of his rebellion, he was living in this horrible, horrible house. And I remember going to visit him in this house it was dirty, it was noisy, windows were broken, doors didn't shut. And I went to my parents' home and I walked into his bedroom. A beautiful bedroom, clean, neat. And I can remember wondering, God, why, why, why does he want that and not this? Why doesn't he want the protection of this home? Why does he want that? 
And as Jesus is looking at Jerusalem, that's his emotion. That's his feeling. I love these people. Why? Why? Why don't they want to be protected? Why don't they want all that I can offer them? Uh, how do these three areas fit? We've seen groups of people throughout Luke's gospel, Pharisees, scribes, lawyers, 12 really dedicated disciples, huge crowds. Not everyone is going to follow Jesus. In fact, we know that Jesus is pretty much going to die all by himself. He's going to die alone. And many of the followers of Jesus are going to be by themselves, and many of them are going to be in challenging circumstances where they are one little person in a big group of people. And these two little illustrations of a mustard seed that you can barely see and yeast just a little bit of it that goes a long way. It's an encouragement to us that a little bit of good news, a little bit of the gospel, a little bit of Jesus goes a long, long way. This is huge encouragement for the followers of Jesus. When it looks like the odds are stacked against you, don't be intimidated. The kingdom of God is like a little mustard seed. It's just little. You can barely see it, but it goes into the ground and a little water hits it and boom, you've got a bush. Don't be intimidated. A little bit of gospel goes a long way. And at one point in life, every one of us was an enemy of God, and a little bit of gospel transformed all of us. It's important for us to see this encouragement that Jesus offers. Not everyone is going to follow, but that doesn't mean that we should be intimidated. The kingdom of God is moving forward. It's expanding all the time. And, and the door... Remember back to the last paragraph that we looked at a couple weeks ago, last week, verses 10 to 17. There's a, there's a man who's leading in the synagogue. He's one of the Jewish leaders. And Jesus does this wonderful thing, heals a woman. But this guy, this leader of the synagogue, was so ticked at Jesus that he attacked the crowd. Remember what he said? He said, hey, crowd. There's six days of the week that you can come here and be healed, but don't you come on the Sabbath and be healed. How ridiculous. This man could not turn and repent. This man couldn't place faith in Jesus. He was so stuck in his way of God working that he couldn't see what was right there in front of him. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That example of the door shows us it's hard to come to Jesus. Repentance and faith is the only way. Salvation from Jesus is a free gift, but it's costly. The gospel is this great news that the creator of this universe, God himself, made everything. But, but people like us rebelled against that, and we chose sin over God, and we choose sin over God. And so there's this separation between God and people, and the only way that people can be right with God is through Jesus Christ. And the great news is that God sent Jesus. 
And Jesus paid your sin penalty. He paid my sin penalty. And if you want to be right with God, you have to believe in Jesus, which is your faith, and turn to Jesus and turn away from sin, which is repentance. When you do that, when you turn, God actually intercedes and helps to pull you along. And many of you know this. He helps you, but it's hard. Jesus knew what was ahead. His harsh words for King Herod are interesting. This is, uh, again, really interesting passage because it's very different than other passages. I, I don't know that there are other times in the New Testament that Jesus speaks so harshly. Referring to Herod as a fox. You tell that fox. His harsh words do not mean that rulers placed there by God will not be held responsible for their evil, the suffering that they inflict on people. But the theme of that last paragraph in verses 31 to 35 is definitely Jesus loves people. His desire is they would find everything they need in Him. Several stories have been told of fires on farms. I, I've heard farmers talk about barns that have burned down. And, and obviously, dry hay and straw are often kept in a barn. And sometimes uh, lightning will hit the barn or something will happen and there'll be a fire and a barn will burn to the ground. And it goes up quickly. And I've heard actual stories of Farmers afterwards going in, walking among the ashes, and there'll be a lump, and they'll kick the lump. And it's a hen who has burned to death, and as they kick the lump, little chicks will run out because this hen has put herself over her chicks, and she dies. She takes the fire on herself and protects her chicks so that they can live. That's the heart of Jesus. That's what he means when he said, oh, that I could be like a mother hen covering and saving my people. He wants the death to fall on him so that his people could have life. What does this mean for us today? I, I hope that the Holy Spirit is applying these words in your life. There are hundreds of situations that you face that I have no, no idea about. But at least we should realize some of the truth of these verses and their implications. And I want to move backwards through the passage quickly. Jesus wants to save people. Jesus wants people to be saved. He looked at Jerusalem and that picture of the mother hen taking death on herself so that her chicks could be free and have life is Jesus. That's what Jesus feels, what he wants. And I could not help but think about what happened in Florida just a few days ago. We've only had a few days to process what happened at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. But I, I looked at this picture of these students running away, and I look at them as little chicks and say, you need a mother hen to protect you. Jesus wants to save people. And right now, I know that every one of you knows a person who needs Jesus. And even as I'm speaking right now, I'm going to ask that you would just mention that name and mention it in your thoughts and throw it up to heaven today. Because the Jesus that we have been loving and worshiping and singing about today wants people to be saved. And that's 
the lesson from the chicken. The door reminds us that repentance and faith is hard, but it's the only way to Jesus. Most Sunday afternoons, uh, Debbie and I go out for a walk with our dog. And several weeks back, we were talking, and there was a man that rode his bike by us two times. And he came back a third time, and he said, are you guys believers? And we said, yes, we are. And he said, do you go to Calvary Church? <laughs> well, yeah, we, every once in a while, we, we darken the doors there. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the man had on a biking helmet. I could say, oh, I remember. This guy used to come in to Calvary about once a year and talk to me about issues that he had. He knows more about the history of our church than I do. He knows more about the Evangelical Free Church of America than I do. But he cannot place his faith in Jesus Christ alone. He cannot repent from sin. He doesn't know Jesus. Repentance and faith is hard, but it's the only way to Jesus. The last truth is the first truth that we started with. The mustard seed and the yeast. The kingdom of God is the most powerful work on earth, and it's constantly expanding. It may start small, but it will be the biggest ever. It may seem like it's just one little drop of water in a bucket, but it will transform the entire bucket. One drop of the gospel in the ocean transforms the ocean. And this morning, I ask you to pray for it. Pray for it with me. Jesus told us, how to pray earlier in Luke. And this morning, I'm going to ask that you would pray these words out loud with me right now. Let's pray this to God right now. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Oh God, your glorious cause engages our hearts. May Jesus Christ be known wherever we are. We ask not for ourselves, but for your renown. The cross, the cross has saved us, and so we pray, your kingdom come. Give us your strength, O God. Give us your courage to speak. Perform your wondrous deeds through those of us who are weak Lord, use us as you want, whatever the test, because it is by grace we'll preach the gospel till our dying breath. Let your kingdom come, God. Let your will be done, Lord, so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard everywhere on earth till your sovereign work on earth is done. Let your kingdom come, we pray. In Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. amen.